Lecture 41, Francois Rabelais. This lecture is on Francois Rabelais, great French writer who was born in 1494, who died in 1553. The title characters of Rabelais' great work, Gargantua and Pantagruel, are possibly the most famous giants in literature, but it's not simply the characters. It's the book itself, which is gigantic. It's gigantically exuberant, and for that reason, very hard to get a handle on. It's comedy, satire, myth, ribaldry, one might even say obscenity. Portions of this lecture may be rated R. It's burlesque, it's fantasy, it's farce, it's parody, and it's politics, all deeply imbued with Renaissance humanist philosophy. It's learned and it's also lewd at the same time, and sometimes it's most learned when it's most lewd. This is not a combination that is everybody's cup of tea, nor is it a combination that everybody immediately gets. It's a book that has been extravagantly praised. It's also been a book that has been subject to the sincerest form of flattery, imitation, with folks from Stern to Joyce uh, doing their Rabelaisian thing. Joyce is very interesting, by the way, in this regard. There's a letter where Joyce says, gee, Rabelais is a good guy, but I've never really read him. And then, later on, one reads in Ulysses that by the end of Ulysses, Molly Bloom is quoting Rabelais in her famous soliloquy. So somewhere between the letter and Ulysses, uh, he changed his mind. It's also a book that has been publicly denounced and publicly banned as well. So just even to explain what it is, uh, shows that there are going to be a lot of difficulties coming to some sort of overarching sense of it. It's hard to pin down for a few other reasons as well. In physical terms, what is presented now as a single volume is really a work in progress that takes place over the course of Rabelais' lifetime. It's published as five separate books over a fairly long period of time. There are issues with the ordering of those books, and there's also an issue about how much of the fifth book is actually by Rabelais. Do they represent, or does the fifth rep book represent Rabelais pure and simple? Most scholars don't think so, but as in the standard English translation, uh, this is the translation by Donald Frame, and as long as I'm plugging this one, I might also say that Frame is the best translator of Montaigne as well. Uh, the frame translation includes the fifth book, but makes no claim for its authorship. It's included for reasons of completeness, and then there are some comments about, you know, it, it, the best guess sort of being that it's uh, notes assembled by Rabelais and finished by someone else probably after his death. But in any case, uh, it's, it's a problem, and there's a problem within the five books as well. Uh, book one presents the story of Pantagruel, the second book presents the story of his father Gargantua. But the editors, including modern editors, have reversed this order and placed Gargantua ahead of Pantagruel to make the work chronologically apt. And so what you're getting uh, really uh, depends on the work of many editors in addition to the work of Rabelais himself. Rabelais' life is only marginally easier to pin down than his work, but it's worth following, I think, because it provides some keys to what is most interesting and perhaps also what is most typical in Gargantua and Pantagruel. Born in 1494, he was tutored as, uh, at home for a little bit, but he received his first formal education at a fairly strict Franciscan friary, uh, in Poitou in France. Well, the downside of that education was that it was exactly the sort of rote scholasticism that Erasmus, for example, complained about, and Rabelais would later, in fact, mock it in his own work. The upside is that the Franciscans were an order of preachers, and right from their founding, with Francis of Assisi himself, they had developed techniques of preaching which were vivid and lively, 
which is to say they always had at their disposal a stock of anecdotes, some of them very secular, which they would apply to religious purposes. And they also were pretty good at the, again, in their preaching techniques, at the picturesque turn of phrase. This was something, of course, that also finds its way into Gargantua and Pantagruel. While he was there, and more or less surreptitiously, he studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. His Latin was good enough so that he actually sent some letters to Erasmus, who remains a hero of his and also a great influence. Uh, I would, in fact, say that the praise of folly is almost a kind of master guide for a lot of what happens in Rabelais' fiction. Not that the stories are the same, but the notion of mixing satire and folly with an attempt to get at some serious truths uh, really underpins an awful lot of what Rabelais does. Well, uh, his Greek was good enough. If his Latin was good enough to write to Erasmus, his Greek was good enough to translate the satirist Lucian. Remember, when we talked about Erasmus, we said that Lucian was a very strong influence on Erasmus's work, and he's also going to be somebody who influences Cervantes later on. Well, at a certain point, his Greek texts were confiscated. The Sorbonne, of all places, had banned the study of Greek. I guess that, to put it into sort of contemporary terms, the Sorbonne, a kind of bastion of conservatism and also a bastion of educational and religious privilege, thought that the folks who were getting involved in this humanist movement by going back to Greek sources were a little bit too uppity and a little bit too liberal. But again, the intellectual issues are always mixed in, I think, with questions of power. So once his books were banned, he sort of left the Franciscans, but he left the Franciscans only to join the Benedictines. In fact, he stayed for two years, 1524 to 1526, at a Benedictine monastery, and then hit the road, more or less. He became secretary to a fairly high-ranking bishop, and even though he was still officially on the books, as a Benedictine, what he did was travel with this bishop throughout a fairly large diocese, and that enabled him to come in contact with all kinds of different people, speaking all kinds of interesting rustic dialects, and who were, in a way, a kind of repository for folk tales, for popular tales of one kind or another, which also found their way into his fiction. Once again, we need to remember that unlike the early humanist, Rabelais writes in French, and so all of this stuff that he's learning about French dialects is going to be important. But again, considering his erudition, that decision turns out to be an important one. We talked about it with the earlier French writer, Christine de Pizan, and we could say the same thing, I think, in terms of uh, the medieval forebears uh, who so influenced this notion of a kind of... Um, attempt to surpass the writings of the Greeks and the Romans. Dante writing in Italian, Chaucer writing in English, to name the two, who made the same deliberate choice. But again, the contrast that I want to make is to Moore and to Erasmus, who wrote for a humanist circle. And again, just to sort of repeat, there were two reasons to write in French. One, to write in French is to re receive a bigger audience in France. And two, to make the vernacular into, to try and shape it into a worthy successor of Greek and of Latin. It's implicitly making the case that what those languages did, the vernacular can do as well. He's still a priest, but he's no longer a Benedictine, and he sets out to do some more learning uh, and also to do some teaching. The Center for Medical Studies in France at this time was the University of Montpellier, and he went there, and he also stayed for a while at Paris and studied medicine. He was already conversant in theology and in law, and in a way, theology, law, medicine together is sort of a hat trick for uh, education. We'll see a little bit later when we talk about Dr. Faustus in the next le lecture that Faustus is himself somebody who is learned in those three disciplines. He put his Greek to good use by translating some of the works of Hippocrates, the Greek medical thinker, 
and he probably put his medical training to even better use because nobody ever did more to talk about in great detail the human body uh, than Rabelais in Gargantua and Pantagruel, even though for the most part he was interested in those parts of the bodies, th those parts of the body which were below the waist. Uh, he has things to say uh, all over the place, really, anatomically speaking. Um, for example, third book, Alco Fribas, who is A, one of the narrators, and B, Alco Fribas Nassier, his full name, turns out to be an anagram for Francois Rabelais. Alka Fribas, and therefore one of the chief characters in the work, travels down into Pantagruel's mouth. And in that same book, a team of peasants is lowered into his stomach in order to remove a mountain of ill-digested waste. That's a lot of fun, too. Okay, around this time, that is to say the same time as his medical training, the first book of Pantagruel was published. There was a popular book of no particular merit that had come out recently called The Chronicles of the Great and Inestimable Gargantua. It was about a family of giants whose function was to protect King Arthur. They had, in fact, been created by Merlin the Magician, and this was good popular entertainment. What Rabelais does is write a spoofing sequel to this book under the name of Alka Fribas Nassier, and it turns out that the course of French literature changes from that moment on. This was a very extreme, a very interesting time in French history. French kings at this time fought a series of wars against some of the Italian city-states. Italy, you'll remember, uh, is not united as a country to the 19th century, and one of the reasons why Italy keeps losing wars is that places like uh, France were united into strong nation states and, and Italy wasn't. And in particular, uh, the French kings asserted rights to rule over Milan and Naples. One of the consequences is that Italian culture begins to permeate French culture in a new way. When I teach humanities, a course that we have, which is a sort of great books course that goes from Plato uh, through Shakespeare, one of the things that I do, it, we're not given nearly as much time to talk about the Romans as the Greeks. We do Plato, and we do Thucydides, and we do uh, uh, some Greek drama, and we get like a week and a half to do the Romans. So I start out with my big generalization. Roman armies conquered Greece. Greek culture conquers Rome. And appropriate changes being made, that's kind of what happens at this time and in this place. French armies conquered not Italy, but parts of Italy, and Italian culture conquers France. The French learned from the achievements uh, of the Italians in the visual arts, okay, from the tradition from Giotto through Donatello and the other great uh, painters and sculptors of the Italian Renaissance. In literature, one thinks of the superstars, of Dante, of Petrarch, of Boccaccio. And also remember, Dante had already been brought to France by Christine de Pizan. And also, the Italians were ahead of the game in the study of the classical languages that is the hallmark of humanist culture. One reason for this is that when Byzantium fell in 1453, when Constantinople was conquered by the Ottoman Turks, an awful a lot of the scholars from Byzantium found their way west and therefore to Italy. And both Venice and Florence, to pick two examples, became, uh, became sort of places in exile for Greek scholars who brought with them not only their knowledge, but equally important, who brought with them their texts. And so essentially, Italy was uh, a bit ahead of the curve, and this is one of the things uh, that therefore found its way to France in this exchange that was taking place because of, the, uh, be because of the French presence in Italy at this, po at this point. So it's kind of an interesting mixed bag. Rabelais himself, by the way, made a number of, he made four trips to Rome during his lifetime. So this is something, uh, this assimilation of Italian culture is something that he certainly got 
um, on his own, as well as seeing it come uh, over, over the Alps. Um, they wanted, the French kings did two things. They wanted political power, and they wanted their share of the cultural inheritance that they saw stretching all the way back to Greece and to Rome. They took the art of state building very seriously in both of these regards. The job of a monarch is to increase the prestige of the court and to increase governmental power. Now, one way, of course, of increasing prestige at court is by being a patron to writers and scholars. So the French brand of humanism, careful study of original texts in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, was something that for a while was encouraged and patronized by the French monarchy. And of course, along with it, that sense of religious revival and religious reform, of going back to the sources, which was so central as we saw in the works of Erasmus. But this sort of, again, for matters of prestige, among other things, really ticked off the folks at the Sorbonne and at other influential conservative places. So from their point of view, that is to say from the point of view of those entrenched in power, reform begins to look an awful lot like sedition. And it seems to me to be the case that at a certain point, they really forced the French kings to sort of backtrack and become very conservative. So essentially, humanist hopes were against the were playing against the odds in power struggles and alliances. And after the 1540s in particular, the humanists were largely replaced by uh, intolerance, skepticism, and even religious persecution. All of this also found its way into Rabelais' work. One way in which it did is that in 1545, the Sorbonne was authorized to draw up a list of books to be censured, and Pantagruel and Gargantua were condemned for obscenity. But at the same time, the king himself, or at least a royal privilege, was granted for the printing of the third book. Meanwhile, while he's doing the third book, there's a gap of about a dozen years between the publication of the second book and the publication of the third. He receives his doctorate in medicine and becomes allied with a very powerful French family, the Du Bellay family, who were very interested in reconciling the differences between Protestants and Catholics. So here you have this amazing contradiction. The monarchy itself, especially in Francis I and Henry II, were adopting more and more severe attitudes and severe tactics to religious dissent, whereas Rabelais himself is allied with someone who is trying very hard, really, to bridge the gap uh, between Protestants and Catholics. It seems to me that this is reflected in what happens in the third book, of Gargantua and Pantagruel, which is published in 1546, that the first two books really can be seen in all of their wildness, in all of their gargantuan um, fecundity. They can nonetheless be seen as a kind of optimistic statement of humanist beliefs. The third book seems to be a bit more pessimistic. It seems to question and perhaps even undercut something of the optimism of the first two. So that one of the major themes, I think, in book three of Gargantua and Pantagruel is the whole question of the limits of human wisdom to create a just community and to communicate well in a world where the moral problems are very tangled indeed. This book, by the way, also was condemned by this Sorbonne. And it also, I think, is a fairly severe meditation, again, in its exuberant way, on the idea of human progress, especially as that progress is seen in scientific terms. Like many of his 
thoughtful contemporaries, Rabelais wonders about a technology that produces both the printing press and gunpowder. And this is a time when gunpowder all of a sudden is changing the nature of warfare big time. Uh, that it is a technological revolution that in some ways uh, is uh, almost, as, uh, almost a a as, as great in its results as the printing press itself. At one point in Book 3, Rabelais makes a very interesting pun. He is, of course, in his exuberant use of language, one of the great punsters uh, in the French language and certainly in any European language. And he puns on the word, French word, breviaire, B-R-E-V-I-A-R-E. -E. Well, it's a prayer book, breviary in English, but it's also a word for wine flask. Hmm. One can see how the guardians of orthodoxy might get a little bit anxious over that one. And in fact, wine itself is a huge theme in Gargantua and Pantagruel. Wine as a source of inspiration. Thirst is associated with getting drunk, but it's also associated with creativity and even transcendence. It becomes a symbol for looking for the divine. So there are long glosses on the meaning of thirst that can be seen uh, as, again, <laughs> the anatomy master putting all of the, his, his knowledge to use there. But at the same time, it's, let's say, on a discussion of the big theological issues of his day. What's the relationship, to take one that we've seen before, between what humans can accomplish on their own and what they can only accomplish through divine help? The last two books continue this theme, that is to say, uh, the precariousness of the world that we live in, the world when uh, the optimistic hopes have been somewhat dashed. And so, for example, a journey that takes place in Book 4, which shows the literal risk of physical danger, becomes a way for Rabelais to talk about the figurative dangers of intolerance, of spiritual blindness of moral darkness. What happens when adherents of a doctrine or a set of beliefs or a style of life turn into uncompromising extremists? This is one of the issues that the, the book really does tackle. Gargantuan and Rabelaisian have been part of, have become part of our everyday vocabulary um, it's sort of interesting. Gargantuan means you know, huge, and Rabelaisian now becomes a sort of synonym for body. Unfair in one sense, because of course it extracts one element from an amazingly complex interplay of linguistic exuberance. But if it brings us to the text itself, that might not be a bad thing. I want to say a little bit about Gargantuan and Rabelaisian in terms of what this might mean in a deeper sense. Let's start with the Rabelaisian business first, okay? Uh, obscenity. Hmm. I have two experiences from my own career as student and teacher, both of them connected with Rabelais' English cousin in body, Geoffrey Chaucer. When I was a sophomore in high school, I had a very wise teacher who introduced Chaucer by giving us one of his uh, less complicated tales, and then saying, but I can't tell you about the Miller's Tale. You're not old enough for that. And then gave us a little bit of, uh, you know, a couple of hints about what was going on there. Needless to say, we all made uh, a mad rush to the library to read the Miller's Tale and to find out what Chaucer was all about. Many years later, I was finishing graduate school, okay? And I went to my mentors and I said, I'm going to be teaching Chaucer for the first time. Any recommendations? And they said, well, Chaucer's somebody who really does sell himself. All you really need to do is read the text out loud. Pause. Beat, two beats, three beats. Keeping in mind never to read the bodiest parts. Well, I thought that was weird then, and I think it's even weirder now, because it seems to me that if anything in Chaucer sells, if anything in Rabelais sells, it's the body parts. But what it, what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it suggests that in sort of academic circles, there's something a little bit not right 
about being coarse and body, whereas in Rabelais' own time, especially in common speech, this was not a problem at all. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves of this because we sort of are rebelling against our Victorian forebears. We keep thinking that the farther back in time you, you trace it, the more straight-laced people are. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and if you get to Rabelais' time, in fact, uh, bodily functions were never taboo, uh, and Rabelais sort of turns this into both high art and low art. Um, just to give one example, Rabelais has no less than 36 different terms for doing it, for copulation. I don't know if he holds the world's record, but I think he's got to be a contender. And what's interesting is if you look at these, these are never really done in an erotic or titillating sort of way. Um, he's much more interested in the comic and even the bizarre. I'll give you one example. Uh, in one speech where one character is trying to say to the other something like, okay, I'm paraphrasing here, I beseech you in the name of all that is good and decent. What in fact he says is, I beseech you in the name and reverence of our four buttocks that engendered you and the life-giving kingpin that for a time coupled them. Again, I don't know how much of an ex exegesis that you need, but our four buttocks doesn't mean mine and yours. It means the four, add two cheeks and two cheeks that are necessary to do the act of generation and the kingpin that for a time brought them together. Well, that's, you know, not much more that I want to say there. Uh, he also, of course, likes to talk about bodily elimination in all of its forms. If he has 36 terms for copulation, not entirely clear to me how many terms he has for excretion, that he is, if you will, uh, way more scatological uh, than sexual. And I don't know whether I'm you know, performing the same function as my 10th grade English teacher, if that's, if that's the thing that's going to send you all out uh, to this volume, that's fine by me. Uh, okay? Second thing that I want to talk about, because that's obscenity, that's the gargantuan part. Second thing that I want to talk about, I'm sorry, that's the Rabelaisian part, duh. Uh, second thing I want to talk about is the over-exuberance. Uh, how much is enough? It's never enough. The quote here, I was told is from Pascal. I'm not sure it is, but let's pretend it is. Um, Pascal writes to somebody, I'm sending you a long letter because I don't have time to write you a short one. In that, I think the whole principle of economy, that is a principle of rhetoric from the Greeks through Pascal and even later, can be well seen. And it's a principle that I certainly try to put, my, put to use in my own teaching of writing. In the college classroom, 90% of the flabby writing that I see is due to the fact that my students say it in more words than they need to, what I like to call the lard factor. And an awful lot of what I do when I'm in conference with them, when I'm grading their papers, is to cross things out, say it more simply. And I'm absolutely convinced that the reason that they use excessive wordage is because they really don't know exactly what they're saying, and if they think they say it a couple different times, it will be more clear. It won't, and once they recognize that, I think uh, that we can make progress. Well, that being the case, what do you do with somebody like Rabelais, whose principle is exactly the opposite? Why use six words for something is six, if 65 will do? Um, I think that if one of my students were to say to me, okay, you tell me to write less, what about Rabelais? Or, for that matter, what about Shakespeare? Or what about Montaigne, who is exploring with us as we go along? In fact, this exuberance is really one of the characteristics of the Renaissance uh, that distinguishes it, I think, from other periods. Well, the only answer that I could give would be something like this. Um, in fact, it's exuberant. In fact, they use many, many more words than classical ideas of decorum would argue for, but Rabelais knows exactly what he's doing. He could write it your way. You couldn't write it his. 
And so I think that I could both sort of um, you know, convince my students that they still have to learn to be a little bit more economical and get them uh, to be lovers of the great exuberance that is Rabelais as well.